The lords of the Chaos Realms chided Meridnunda for her trespass, and bade her return to Orbis, claiming all existing spheres as their own. But Meridnunda formed of her substance a great drag lens, and the light of Magnus was bent thereby. The rays focused and carved a new sphere from the Chaos, which Meridnunda, laughing and sparkling, did claim for her own. The Daedric Prince Meridia, formerly known as Meridnunda, was once a divine child of light, one of Magnus' own kin, a daughter of the Architect, and of Aetherius. Her purity was unrivaled, born of the same cleansing magic that brings all life to the mortal realm. She was destined to tear a rift in the Veil of Oblivion, to retreat to the Aedric realm with her siblings, living on as a star in the night sky. Only she was forsaken, cast down by her father Magnus, the god of magic, and by her brothers and sisters, indicted for the most heinous of crimes. She consorted with the Daedra, with the illicit spectra, with the forces of darkness and disarray, and so she did not ascend back to Aetherius, and she spiralled off on her own trajectory, with oblivion her destination. This child of light did not belong among the Daedra, and the Daedric princes, ever the territorial bunch, did not welcome her. However, Meridnunda was carried into oblivion by Magnus's light. She was propelled by the overwhelming power of the sun, and as one of his children, a member of the Magna Ghi, she could bend and shape the rays as she saw fit. Thus the coloured rooms were created in the chaos of oblivion, and Meridia's worth was displayed to all the princes who disparaged her. She was now a Daedric prince herself, and not Dagon nor Baal nor Azura, nor any of the other lords could do anything about it. Hey guys, it's Drew the Daedrologist here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. If you're familiar with my research, you'll know I spent a lot of time delving into the metaphysics of the many Daedric Princes, leaving no stones unturned. But there were a few lords I left out. It's no exaggeration to say that of all the mysteries and ambiguity surrounding these deities, Meridia is one of the most, if not the most, difficult to decipher. Her sphere seems simple, she is associated with light, and the energies of all living things. But this sphere seems exceedingly out of place. You'd expect a sphere like this to be listed next to one of the Adric Divines, not next to a Daedra. There's also the fact that this sphere is very vague. Considering her origin story, which I summarised a moment ago, it's safe to say that she's an anomaly, and understanding the other Daedric Princes really doesn't help when trying to understand Meridia. She's one of a kind, yet despite this, in today's video, we're going to do our very best to clear up all the confusion, and as befits the prince, we're going to search for some clarity, examining her history, her lore, and her meaning. A new hand touches the beacon. Listen, hear me, and let's get right into it. Meridia, the Lady of Infinite Energies, the Glister Witch. Her infinity for light and the energies of all living things is only trumped by one other thing, and that is her everlasting hatred for the undead. Anywhere that the undead can be found, so too can her beacon. She will reward any mortal who eliminates undead abominations from the mortal world. Meridia is actually one of the few Daedric Princes perceived by mortals as not being evil. Of course, we've established over the course of the series that the dichotomy of good and evil is far too simplistic to be applied to such enigmatic entities. But in the case of Meridia, the distinction does hold some weight. Because she has a unique origin story, it is actually fair to define her as good. For every other Daedric Prince, what distinguishes them from the Aedra is the fact that they had no interest in assisting in the creation of Mundus, the mortal realm. And while she may have been cast out on the return journey to Aetherius, there is no denying the fact that Meridia did elect to aid Lorcan in the creation of mortals. Granted, Magnus and his children withdrew the moment they discovered the bulk of their godly powers would be tied up in their creation, but she still contributed a great deal more than any of the other Daedra Lords. That fact in and of itself shows that she's more invested in the overall well-being of mortals. Meridia has two known artefacts. The first is called the Ring of Khajiiti. However, unlike her other artefact, this one is also associated with another prince, Mafala. Both ladies have been known to offer the ring as a reward to favourable mortals. The ring supposedly makes the wearer invisible, silent, 
and quick as a breath of wind. A Khajiit named Rajin became a legend across elsewhere for stealing the ring off of Mafala's arm. He later became revered as the thief god of the Khajiit. Using the ring's powers, Rajin became the most successful burglar in elsewhere's history. It is even said that Rajin stole a tattoo from the neck of Empress Kintyra as she slept. Rajin's eventual fate is a mystery, but according to the stories passed down by generation after generation of Khajiit, the ring rebelled against such constant use and disappeared, leaving Rajin helpless before his enemies. Meridia's main artifact, the one that is undoubtedly hers and hers alone, is called Dawnbreaker. This magnificent sword was forged in a holy light that breaks upon the prince's foes. Somewhat reminiscent of an ebony longsword, Dawnbreaker's most noteworthy feature is the crystal held in its crossguard. This crystal is called the Dawnstar Gem, and it emits angelic rays which will incinerate all undead that bathe in its cleansing light. According to Meridia's own words, the sword was forged to burn away all corruption and false life. Meridia, through her sword Dawnbreaker, has been known to aid mortals in conflict with other Daedric Princes. During the plane meld, as Molag Bal the Dominator attempted to merge his realm of Cold Harbor with the mortal realm, Meridia bestowed the power of Dawnbreaker upon the Fighters Guild. She also gave a Breton warrior named Darian Gautier Dawnbreaker in his battles with Mafala, Clavicus Vile, and Nocturnal's mortal cult, the Court of Bedlam. Meridia's realm of oblivion is called the Coloured Rooms. Scarce little is known of this place, but the few who have visited and live to describe the plain say it is like a coral reef, and above the reef there are fields of floating stones. The horizon is painted like an artwork, with vivid trails of dust and cloud strewn across the skies. Connecting the coral reefs and the fields of stone, the ground looks like luminescent water, rippling and flowing like an ocean, despite being firm to those who walk atop it. The Daedric inhabitants of the Coloured Rooms are known as the Aurorans. No mortal has seen an Auroran without their signature seraphic armour. This armour is usually golden, but can take on any hue. Beneath their armour the Aurorans are made from pure light, and they can channel this blinding light together by assembling in a phalanx formation, coalescing their power into devastating coordinated attacks. And with that, we've pretty much reached the end of our understanding of Meridia. Little else of value is known about her. We could talk about the Magna Ghi, about their creation of another Daedric Prince in the bowels of Lig, and how horrifically wrong that went. However, that is a topic for our next video. But this wouldn't be a Daedrology video if we didn't attempt to uncover some new information, some hidden meaning, some misconception that is in dire need of debunking. And luckily I have just the thing. You see, Meridia has been written off by many scholars. She's the benevolent lady of life, she hates the undead, and she loves the living. If you're a mortal and you aren't a reanimated corpse, well, you're bound to be loved by the Lady of Infinite Energies. But to come to this conclusion, you have to turn a blind eye to history, for Meridia has been embroiled in much death and destruction, and her loyal Aurorans have killed countless humans. This seems rather out of character for the Daedric Prince of Life, which seems like a blatant misnomer given her interactions with the mortals of the First Era. The Heartland Elves, known to most as the Aelids, crafted a mighty empire at the pinnacle of Tamriel. This empire was so spectacular that the long abandoned ruins of their once prosperous civilization still to this day puzzle and fascinate modern archaeologists and adventurers. The great white gold tower reaching towards Aetherius from the centre of the province has always been a lodestone for power and brilliance, and it exists thanks to the Aelid architects. But for each and every one of their achievements, countless human lives were exchanged. The pristine white surfaces of their citadels were without blemish, yet an ocean of Nedic blood was spilled in their construction. At first, the enslavement of the Nedic peoples was occasional, but eventually it became systematic, widespread, an institution of their society. They eventually controlled the entirety of modern-day Cyrodiil, and kept the Nedic peoples there enslaved for generations. As the populace became desensitised to the subjugation of men, so too did they become desensitised to the profane and the perverse. Daedra worship was a fundamental facet of Aelid worship, and they turned cruelty into an art form. Many Daedra worshipping Aelids across Cyrodiil derived strange pleasures from art tortures, from the wailing wheels of Vindazel to the gut gardens of Cersen. 
the Aelids committed near infinite atrocities against living things. Without any distinction between good and bad Daedra, the Aelids had somehow reconciled veneration for Meridia with reverence for Molag Bal. How these seemingly antithetical entities could both be worshipped by one culture is perplexing. The Aelids enjoyed torture and enslavement, yet they also valued the power of light, particularly starlight, above all other things. Many Aelid quotes that survive to fill the history books refer to light and to the stars. These phrases included, From fire, life. From light, magic. And our exiled elven ancestors heard the welcoming gifts of peace in the streams and beech trees and stars. If you had any doubts about the Aelid affinity for light and the stars, you need only look at their slowly eroding architecture. They used ethereal fragments which fell from the heavens, particularly meteoric iron, to construct receptacles which are believed to harness energy from starlight. These Aelid wells are scattered all over Cyrodiil, and can still be used by mages to replenish their energy. They also kept specially cut pieces of meteoric glass known as Welkin Stones, meaning literally Sky Children, as storage containers for magical energy, as well as what are called Vala Stones, or Star Stones. All of these names sound remarkably like names one would use to describe the Magna Gi, and the stars seen from Tamriel are the rifts left behind by the retreating star orphans. You can see why Meridia, being both a former member of the Magna Gi and a Daedra, would be at the height of Aelid religion. But with all of the Aelid's cruel transgressions in mind, could Meridia, the Lady of Life, truly reciprocate their adoration? Well, when the oppressed Nedic humans fought back and the Elysian Slave Rebellion commenced, Meridia's actions spoke volumes, and we could see her true colours reveal themselves. Meridia made a pact with the Aelids, sending her Aurorans to fight alongside the Aelids. She bestowed the Aelid Sorcerer King Umriel the Unfeathered with immortality ahead of his battle with the legendary Pelena Whitestrake. Despite her intervention, the Aelids were defeated, and Umriel was cast adrift in the waters of oblivion. Saved from death by Meridia, who provided him safe harbour in her coloured runes, where he could re-muster his strength. Say what you will about Meridia, claim her to be benevolent and protective, but much can be learned from her choice of allegiances. She endorsed the Aelids and Umaril, and there is no questioning their crimes against men, and against every living mortal's right to freedom and to life. Meridia may have once been a child of Magnus, a shining star in the night sky, but she was not cast out without reason. And unlike the Divines, she did not devote her deific powers to the creation of the mortal realm. She preaches her love for light and for life, yet when she is given an opportunity to prove it with her actions, she does not deliver. You need only listen to her speak to the last Dragonborn to see that she is quite vain, even sanctimonious. Look at my temple, she says, lying in ruins. So much for the constancy of mortals, their crafts and their hearts. If they love me not, how can my love reach them? And it is time for my splendor to return to Skyrim. Blinded by her beatific radiance and her commanding voice, Meridia portrays herself as the very embodiment of purity and goodness. But it is only skin deep, as she will easily compromise her love of life to aid any mortals who fuel her desire to be venerated. And there you have it guys, the Glister Witch, the Lady of Life and of Infinite Energies, the Daedric Prince Meridia. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, a like means an awful lot to us here at Fudge Muppet. Thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, and I'll see you next time.